on today's show, we're breaking down five things we learned about the Rangers in maybe the most bipolar month in team history. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on to the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, the founder and host for all five seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. Today is Thursday, August 31st. Your Rangers are 75 and 58, holding that third wildcard spot and in second, third place in the AL West, one game behind those stinking Houston Astros and Seattle Mariners. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Subscribe on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to listen every day and to comment and nearly any single thing below. Before we get into today's episode, this episode is brought to you by Bunches. Download the Bunches app today, and when you do, our friends at Bunches have featured the Locked On MLB Bunch in the Discover tab. You can also click on the link in the description and show notes to join the Locked On MLB Bunch community today. Now, the Rangers closed out this incredibly bipolar month with a loss, a one-run loss, in a game where, uh, you guessed it, the bullpen blew it. But the offense was rallying. The offense really came up with some clutch rallies, and including some big hits by Corey Seager, Nathaniel Lowe, Adolis Garcia, some big walks also, and a big hit by pitch by Adolis Garcia, and just a really team effort and really a huge hit by Jonah Heim, who is looking much, much better, much like the Jonah Heim of all. He was back in the number six hole today. He was hitting behind Mitch Garver. I think this might be a similar lineup that we see when Josh Young comes back. Maybe they'll ease him back in. Maybe they'll put him in the five hole. I'm not entirely sure. We still haven't gotten any extra updates on him. We did get an update on Nathan Evaldi, who threw a bullpen again on Tuesday, and it seems like the Rangers aren't going to call him or bring him back off the IL on Friday, tomorrow, as you're listening to this, or maybe today as you're listening to this. But there will be a decision made sometime, I think, this weekend as to whether or not he is going to go on a rehab outing or if he's just going to go straight back into this rotation. He is feeling good. Everything is looking better. That setback did not happen. So, I mean, it was just a a mild precautionary, you know, step back, not a setback, if that makes any sense. So some good news on the Eovaldi injury front uh, because the Rangers definitely needed some good news after that five to six loss another bullpen outing that just did not go well not a great outing for Dane Dunning two in a row that kind of that kind of worried me back-to-back home runs a couple of walks in his four innings of work just three earned runs but still not the best outing for him Martin Perez had a really really solid important three shutout innings in relief he allowed a few base runners worked around them and did his normal thing and Jose LeClerc comes in the eighth inning after the Rangers rally to take the lead and gives up a massive two-run shot because of course he does then Will Smith comes in in a a clutch situation gets an inning in two-thirds and gets out of the jam that uh, well there wasn't any runners on base that Jose LeClerc left there because they were all cleared by the home run but Will Smith had another good outing that is two uh, and two-thirds innings I believe in the last two games that Will Smith has not allowed a single hit. He did allow a walk in this one, struck out a pair, and looked much better. And I think it might be about time to put him back in the closer role because Araldis Chapman faced three batters, and he intentionally walked one. He unintentionally walked another. And then he hit the third one with a pitch for a walk-off hit by pitch. That is a new one. But, of course, it happened to be DJ Stewart, who... I guess apparently is the best hitter on the planet. I I didn't realize this, but uh, yeah, apparently this year he's the best hitter on the planet. 86 at bats this year, a 364 on base, and a 1,015 OPS. Nine home runs in 86 at bats for DJ Stewart. Okay, I did not see that coming, Um, but sure. A guy who has been uh, pretty mediocre in his career has had one year where he had an OPS over 700, actually two years, um, but he's never played more than, um, you know, he had a 100 game season in 2021, but has never played more than 50 games in a season outside of that. I think this year he has mostly been hurt, but 
when he's been on the field, apparently he's been very effective and very effective at killing the Rangers' chance at a sweep. I really wanted a sweep just to kind of stick it to the Mets, even though that's what they want because they should be tanking because if they don't uh, end up jumping up in the lottery, then their pick is going to move down 10 spots uh, because they are so far over the luxury tax. And uh, yeah, they are also a big market. So they have every incentive to tank and to not win games. But here they are winning one game. Congrats on your Super Bowl Mets because you're not going to actually be in the playoffs or even in the playoff hunt in the month of September because you traded away two of your stars and then had the audacity to be like, yeah, Matt Scherzer actually sucks. We we hate him because he was good for us and uh, just had a not great couple of months, so we traded him away. I, I don't know. It's just a, such a weird, complicated relationship they have with their former aces. But Justin Verlander pitches okay for two months, wins absolutely nothing, and they like him. I, I don't know. I don't. I have given up trying to understand Mets fans, and I have given up trying to understand this bullpen. But I, I'm almost giving up on trying to understand this team. But we did learn five things from this team in the month of August. The most the most bipolar month, I think, in franchise history. I, I cannot recall another month that any team has had where they have an eight-game winning streak and an eight-game losing streak in the same month. Like, it just... It just does not make sense. It does not compute in my brain. I have a stretch where they lose 9 out of 10 after winning, what was it, uh, 12 out of their first 14 this month? Yeah, just absolutely insane. Maybe, I think it was might have been 14 out of their first 16 games because started off on the 8-game winning streak, then they lost one to the A's, and then they won 2 out of 3 against the Giants, and they won 2 out of 3 against the Angels, and then everything went to crap once they started to face those central teams and the Brewers and the Twins and well, also the D-backs and, well, not so much against the Mets. Things pretty went pretty much went well against the Mets, but still, ending it on that loss is an incredibly frustrating way to feel. I mean, it, it's so easy to forget that this team was just kicking everybody's freaking butts, destroying uh, everybody in the first half of this month. I mean, the Giants were a playoff team when the Rangers were facing them, or at least in playoff contention. The Marlins, I think, might have been a game out of wildcard contention when they swept them. The White Sox, yeah, they were pretty hapless. The A's, well, they're the A's. And the Angels hadn't quite fully given up to the point where we've seen them jettison everybody on waivers, but they were still uh, kind of competitive. The Rangers mostly kicked their butts and then got re detmersed in the final game of that series, which, again, those three losses in the first half of the month, or I guess first 16 days of the month, really kind of stick in your craw when you look at the Rangers being just one game behind the Mariners and the Astros for that AOS top spot. But the Rangers will get their shot, and I'll talk more about the month of September, what the Rangers will need to do to win the West. But we are looking at the month that was in August. Coming up, we're going to look at five things we learned about this team in this crazy wild month. But first, let's word from our sponsors. Okay, Rangers fans, I've got to tell you about a new app called Bunches. Bunches is the new app built for sports fans where you can chat sports in real time. Click the link in the show notes and description to join the app or go to the Apple App Store and download Bunches now. I'm telling you, you are going to love the conversations with other Locked On fans. The Locked On MLB group chat is on Bunches. Go there now and connect with other baseball fans, chat about your favorite team, and keep up with the latest MLB news. There's been a lot of news going on about these waiver claims. If you think that, oh, well, I don't, you know, share your thoughts about what's going on in the waiver claim. Just a, a nice, fun group chat. Locked on fans are, you know, normally pretty great. I mean, you know, maybe you can talk a little trash if the Rangers end up going on a little streak and winning the AOS. Maybe you can just have a little, little fun just learning about other teams on the Bunches app. Download the Bunches app today, and when you do, our discover our friends at Bunches. They put the Locked On MLB Bunch in the Discover tab. You can cl- also click the link in the show notes and description to join the Locked On MLB Bunch community today. Shout out to the Everydayers for making Lockdown Rangers your first listen every single day on tomorrow's show. We'll be breaking down the month of August, what's happened on the farm, and looking ahead at what the Rangers have to do in the month of September. The Rangers take on the Twins this weekend. You can catch every pitch of the hometown broadcasts on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search Rangers. Now, let's start with the five things we learned about this team in the month of August. Number one, Corey Seager is unbelievable. Well, I mean, that's not, that's not something that we learned as much as we kind of remembered and refigured out and just seeing a whole new level of Corey Seager. He was absolutely unbelievably good in this month of August, and if not for Julio Rodriguez going absolutely nuclear, he almost assuredly would have won 
AL Player of the Month in August. But for this month, he hit 337 with an on base of 407 and slugged 704, a 1111 OPS. Make a wish. My wish is that Corey Seager stays on this team for another eight years after this. Oh, wait, my wish came true because he's going to be a Texas Ranger for the foreseeable future. He had 10 home runs, six doubles, 22 RBIs in just 24 games. He had the most home runs in the month this year. Uh, among the AL players with 10 home runs in a month. He's got 25 uh, home runs on the season, um, or at least 25. I think he might have 26 after last night's one. Nope, he is still at 25. He is just, he's unbelievably good. And he's a shortstop. And he's a Texas Ranger for the long haul. And there's a whole team around him. It's not just a star shortstop putting up numbers on a bad team for nothing. He is doing this in a month where the Rangers absolutely have needed every single one of his hits, RBIs, runs, homers, doubles, walks, literally everything they have needed from Corey Seager. And he has stepped up to the plate and crushed it all month long. I mean, we, we knew that Corey Seager was a guy who wasn't used to being out of it. And you thought, okay, Last year wasn't the best year for him. Eliminating the shift kind of helped, but also being on a competitive team, I think, also kind of helped him take it to another level. We have seen that next level, and oh my goodness, it is absolutely glorious. RIP to the bat that he was using that got uh, sacrificed for an infield hit on, I believe it was Monday or Tuesday's game that looked like it had been through several world wars um, and famines, and it, it had seen some horrors and it had also dealt out some horrors to opposing pitchers because Corey Seager he's also a six war player a freaking six war player and he has missed basically two months like it's just unbelievable how incredibly good he has been all season long when he is on the field I mean there's no reason at this point that he shouldn't finish second in NL in AL MVP voting even if Shohei went on the shelf and Corey Seager played every game until you know next year or until the end of this year and he had another month where he put up almost these exact numbers except maybe a little bit better he had like 12 home runs in the month or 15 which i don't think that's gonna happen but i mean who freaking knows i'm i'm done doubting any part of Corey seager because he is just so incredibly good another guy who had an incredible month that the rangers really really needed that's right mitch garver is back in the fold he has played 60 games so far this season an 875 ops with 13 home runs on the year and you know, he has been incredible in the month of august when jonah heim went down to injury he has just stepped up in the biggest way. In August, he had exactly 100 plate appearances with eight home runs, a slash line of 302, 394, 628, a 1,022 OPS. I think I made a comment on yesterday's show, or maybe it was the day before show, that, wow, Mitch Garver has a higher OPS in the month of August than Corey Seager. Well, after <laughs> after that game on Wednesday, Corey Seager was like, nope, nope, that's not going to happen. I'm going to have the highest OPS on this team for nearly every single month, and I think he does for nearly every single month. But Mitch Garver coming back into the fold and being able to take some, some of the load off of Jonah Heim, being able to give him some days off, and be a huge bat on this lineup and it's not just been when he's been catching I mean for the most part he was only hitting when he was catching but now he's DHing and he is doing some freaking damage he had some not great at bats um the first game in Shea State or not Shea Stadium um whatever I can't think of the, the name of the Mets field at this moment because words are escaping me but he had a, a ground a ground ball into a double play that in a clutch moment that was kind of frustrating but he did have a, another at bat where he worked a walk and um, looked much better but I mean he was doing damage he's the only one doing damage in the Minnesota series offensively and he was doing a lot of damage in those first two games against the Mets I mean he's not going to hit a home run in literally literally every game against the Mets on the road I mean eventually that's streak has to stop but he has been so good for this team and I have been saying all year that you know Mitch Garver should probably play more Mitch Garver should probably play more well now is the time to play him more when he is hot and keeping him healthy all season by limiting his games and at bats he missed a month and a half maybe it was closer to two months with um, just a weird injury running the bases in Chicago um, against the Cubs which I don't think anybody noticed in real time and he was out for two months but th that's kind of who Mitch Garver is he's a guy who gets dinged up and, and banged up and when he's in the lineup he is incredibly dangerous and when he is hot he can get as hot as anybody and 
I think it might almost be about time to start putting him batting cleanup because the top three in your order are all doing work. Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager, Nathaniel Lowe are all doing some work. And Adolis Garcia is struggling a little bit as of late while Mitch Garver is incredibly hot. I don't know what the Rangers are going to do with Josh on when they get him back. We'll see if they ease him back into the batting order. But I mean, Mitch Garver has been incredible and I don't know how you bump him down much lower in the batting order because he's so good you want him to get those at bats and you want him to do damage which he has and having your backup catcher slash DH be a guy with an 875 OPS that is huge especially when your top catcher is Jonah Heim who was the all-star starter is incredible defensively had another caught stealing I mean the guy has just been incredibly good Ortega was the first time he was caught stealing all year and that was Jonah Heim I think he had two different caught stealings um, base, base runners that he caught stealing in this series and he has looked incredible this last series getting him back to the player he was but still having him and Garver as your catchers that is almost as dangerous a catching duo as the Atlanta Braves have. Not quite, but still incredibly, incredibly good. Now, the third thing we learned about this team, we're going to get to in just a second. But first, this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use and you can be bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Shout out to the Aviators for making Locked On Raiders your first listen every single day on Monday's show. We're breaking down this massive weekend series against Minnesota. The Raiders take on the Twins this weekend. You can catch every pitch for the hometown broadcast on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search Rangers. Now, the third thing we learned about this team in the most bipolar month in franchise history in August is that this rotation is incredibly good. The trades that the Rangers made at the deadline have worked out very, very well for the starting pitchers. I mean, Max Scherzer and Jordan Montgomery combined for 10 starts in this month. They went 62 innings, 70 strikeouts, just 15 walks, and a 247 ERA between them. The rest of this rotation, the entirety of this rotation for the month of August, had 150 and a third innings pitched, a 317 ERA, 10.5 Ks per nine innings, and uh, about five and a half innings per start. That's even with some blow up late or, you know, low starts from you know Dunning from Heaney from even John Gray had some not great starts even Max Scherzer had one very not good start but this rotation remains a huge strength of this team one of the best rotations in all of baseball I mean a 317 ERA for your entire rotation for the month is absolutely bonkers having your one two of Scherzer and Montgomery I think at this point that's what the playoff rotation should be it should be Scherzer then Montgomery uh then Gray, then Heaney, then Dunning. I mean, Dunning's had some some not great um, not great starts this month, including a couple back to back that really kind of are making him come back down to earth. And you kind of almost have to think about maybe putting him in the long man role once Nathan Eovaldi gets back, or you go with a six man rotation. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure when Nathan Eovaldi is going to get back or what level Nathan Eovaldi is going to be at when he does come back. But it's something you kind of might want to consider um, because we'll, we'll get to the bullpen struggles as another thing that we learned even more about this team. But the number four thing we learned in the month of August is uh, it's some bad news. Unfortunately, Travis Jankowski seems to be cooked. He grounded into a double play where he, if he had just st- stood there and taken a ball right to the face, he hit it to the first baseman with no outs in, I believe that was the 10th inning, and he grounded a double play that did not score the run because even a normal double play would have scored the run, but the first baseman threw home and it was right at Travis Jankowski's head, so he had to duck and therefore look back I don't really know why he was looking back I don't know if that would have made a difference in him getting thrown out at first base um, and the Rangers end up scoring no runs and then losing on the walk-off hit by pitch by Roldis Chapman which the way that Roldis Chapman was pitching they might have lost it anyway even if they had a four-run lead it was just 
ugh, it was a rough outing for this bullpen. But Jankowski in this month where he played the most games he has this season, he played 24 games this month, 80 or excuse me, 60 at bats, which is also the most he's had in a single month. Nope, excuse me. Pardon that. July, he had 64 at bats and 60 in August, but he played in more games. But in this month, he was terrible. Honestly, truly terrible. A 167 at batting average, 261 on base, and slugged just 200, a 461 OPS. And this is a guy who is hitting regularly fifth, sixth in the lineup and playing left field almost every day. I know that JPM is a, a rookie, but. I mean, he's got to get those at-bats. I know what Jankowski brings. I know that he brings, you know, good base running, solid at-bats, you know, a pesky bat in the order, but he's just not bringing it enough offensively. He's regressing back to the mean. Those blue pits and bloop doubles and stolen bases and a bunch of walks were, were fun when he had an 800 OPS, but now it's down to 706 on the season. I think it's about time for him to just be a platoon slash bench player, and he just keeps being trotted out there, and I, I just don't think that that's really going to help the Rangers having him out there every day and definitely not having him that high up in the order. I mean, he should be batting eighth, ninth, tenth, not 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 on the uh, in the starting lineup as much as he has been. You got to give you got to give some run to JPM. I, I know that he's only got a 636 OPS on the season. He's hitting just 250 with an on base of 275, and he only has two extra base hits. But like you got to give him some run if he's going to be up there. Otherwise, why is he even up there? Like he's up there to be a pesky at bat to you know occasionally give you something offensively and right now he's just not I mean the ideal scenario is that Josh Young comes back and you put you know uh, Ezekiel Duran as the everyday left fielder I think that is what I would like for my ideal lineup and that's kind of what I thought it would be at the beginning of the season with your primary DH being Mitch Garver and uh, Jonah Heim being your catcher and left field being Zeke Duran and then you kind of you know plug the other guys in as needed. I, I think that is my ideal scenario, and it, it seems like that will end up being the ideal scenario whenever Josh Young does come back, which it's looking like it'll be about the middle of the month of September, and the Rangers could really use him back in there just to to deepen this lineup. I mean, the lineup is incredibly deep, but having adding an all-star, it would basically be a replacement of Travis Jankowski's at-bats for Josh Young's at-bats. That is a huge, huge upgrade for this lineup, and it could be enough to get them on a hot streak for the month of September. The fifth thing we learned about this team in the incredibly bipolar month of August, something we already kind of knew, but we really had that lesson jammed in our faces, just beaten over the brains with it. This bullpen might just be unfixable in save situations this year as a bullpen that's 120 and a third innings this team has a 434 era in save situations now that's not all in the ninth inning but i think that is in situations that also could be um blown saves or extra innings as well in extra innings it's it's even worse this bullpen has a 715 era in extra innings 11 and a third innings pitch four home runs 11 walks to just seven strikeouts if this if the games go to extra innings, the Rangers are just might as well throw in the towel because this bullpen just cannot pitch in extra innings. It is just almost an automatic loss for this team, which is just incredibly frustrating when you are so bad in one run games and close games and have an expected wins loss record that is way better than anybody else in your division. The month of August, they st still did go 15 and 12, still a winning month, still the third most third winningest month of their season. Obviously, May was their best with 18 and 9, then April of 16 and 11, 15 and 12, still a pretty solid month. They've only had one month where they've gone below 500, and that was July where they went 11 and 13. Every other month has been a winning month, including March where they played just one game and went 1 and 0. Oh. Now, this team definitely still has some work to do and, you know, it's been really frustrating to watch this bullpen just melt down. It doesn't really matter who is in the save situation. They just have not come through all season. And Aroldis Chapman in save situations this year, 21 and two thirds innings, 38 strikeouts, which is 
very, very good, but a 457 ERA, three home runs, 18 walks, two box, and six wild pitches. Like it, those little things really start to add up in those save situations. We saw it add up in Minnesota and the save that he blew then, where if he didn't balk the runner over, then maybe the Rangers win that game and maybe it doesn't go to 13 innings. And um, maybe we were talking in a different light where the Rangers are tied atop the AL West as they probably should be. Or actually, no, this team has been so good for most of this year that they should be having like a five game lead going into September, but they don't, they are the team that is chasing. They still do have a playoff spot and they're two and a half games ahead of the blue Jays as of this recording. Um, so this team still is in a good spot. And I talked more about it. I think in yesterday's episode about the advantage the Rangers have over the Astros and the Mariners, like this team has just been good all year. And I know the offense doesn't score 1800 runs every single day. Like they did at the beginning of the year, but we all knew that wasn't sustainable. That doesn't mean that this offense isn't good. They still have Corey Seager up there. They still have Mitch Garver, who's been incredible. They still have Nathaniel Lowe and Marcus Simeon, who are all very good hitters. And even though Dolce Garcia is cold right now, he is still a very, very good hitter. Jonah Heim is a very good hitter. And Ezekiel Duran and Leo Tavares, well, they are pretty hot and cold, but I mean, Duran has mostly done his part stepping in for an injured all-star in Josh Young. And while the defense has, you know, definitely fluctuated at moments, uh, the offense has been pretty solid and Leody Tavares looks like he is heating back up. So, I mean, two thirds of this team is very good. The rotation, very good. The lineup, very good. It's just the bullpen is so debilitatingly bad that it makes it very hard to win these one-run games or even these close games. The Rangers offense has shown the ability to start coming back a little bit more more often this year. Um, later, I mean, in this series, I mean, Marcus Simeon challenged this team to you know, step up and and win some of these games that aren't going to be blowouts, which is what this team really needed to learn how to do, needs to learn how to do down the stretch. And they're going to need to win some close games against the Mariners and against the Astros. Hopefully they can sweep the series against the Astros. If they do, then they will have the tiebreaker. If they win, I think they only need to win two or three games out of those seven against the Mariners in the final 10 to have the, the tiebreaker against them, which I think you'll probably need to win more than two or three to actually win the division where the tiebreaker will come into effect. Um, but still, this team is still in a pretty good position. They could have been in a little bit better position with those waiver claims, but unfortunately the Rangers are getting nobody that the Angels or the other teams put on waivers. The Guardians, who are five back in the AL Central, um, and the Rangers will play in the month of September, which is super annoying. That's going to happen. Um, they are 11 and a half back of the final wild, wild card spot that the Rangers hold. They get Lucas Gilito, Reynaldo Lopez, and Matt Moore. Like, are you freaking kidding me? A team that is five games back in its own division? I don't know. Part of me is, is incredibly pissed off that that's even happening, that this was allowed to happen. But part of me is like, you know what? At least the Astros and the Mariners didn't get them. I think the waiver claims were put in on a Wednesday night. Um, so the Rangers at that point were, uh, maybe it was Tuesday night. I can't remember exactly when it was, but the Rangers were, it seems like they were not going to get any of these very good players. The Reds were the other team that lucked out in the waiver claim sweepstakes. They got Hunter Renfro and Harrison Baders, ha Bader, just one Bader, not Baders, plural. But uh, Randall Gritchick was not claimed. So I'm... I'm a little surprised because Gritchick was owed a, a decent amount of money. And the only other reliever, uh, the only other player on waivers that I saw that did get claimed was Dominic Leone, former Ranger great to the Mariners who have the best bullpen in maybe in baseball. And they felt the need to claim Dominic Leone. I don't really understand. Kind of wish the Rangers had claimed Leone because they were ahead of the Mariners. And I don't really understand not at least trying to claim one bullpen piece that is like at least okay. I get why Moore and and Lopez didn't make it to the Rangers, but still, this is a, a really annoying situation that it's a team that the Rangers are going to have to face, getting you know a pretty good starter and two really good bullpen pieces, and the Reds, who are one game out of the third wild card in the NL, getting Hunter Renfro and Harrison Bader, like that sh just feels kind of nuts to me, but you know, it is what it is, as they say. And if, even though the Rangers weren't allowed to get better on the waiver wire, I don't know that the Mariners necessarily got better by adding Dominic Leone. But hey, at least the Astros didn't get any better, didn't get any of those great players on the waiver wire. I still 
till my dying days will be incredibly pissed the Rangers didn't just re-sign Matt Moore or trade him at last year's deadline, but maybe that's something that I should just get over and move on with. And I think I will if the Rangers do end up winning the AL West or going on a deep playoff run. Maybe all of those anger memories of Matt Moore staying and pitching in meaningless games in September uh, last year are, are going to be erased by some meaningful September games this year. The Rangers may just be one back of the AL West, but hey, we're going to have a meaningful September baseball game or two or three or maybe even 30 it's going to be a lot of fun down the stretch i am so incredibly excited and nervous and agitated and on edge and screaming crying and throwing up at the prospect of september baseball that means something we haven't seen that in a long time but hey i am so so ready for it and even though this team is flawed there's still a very good baseball team. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy Pennant Chase Texas Rangers baseball.